Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so excited to be joined by the fantastic Taylor Page to talk all about one of my favorite movies, Zola. And you originally had seen a script for this project before Janixa Bravo and Jeremy O'Harris came on board, and it was a very different type of project. And once you got the script in your hands, which they had written, what were so many of the complexities and layers and nuances that they just really understood about telling Zola's story that maybe hadn't existed in the previous drafts with other participants writing it? I mean, everything, it was completely, it was a completely different story and a completely different energy and voice and like attention to detail and care and consideration. And, um, but when I read their version, it felt like the collective like sigh that like, I know. And um, it was all, it, yeah, I don't, I mean, they're pretty, those are two really brilliant, high-minded, you know, people, so. I felt much better. <laughs> and when you look at the juxtaposition of your character against Riley Keough's character, Stephanie, there's so many, so many beautiful ways in which Janixa has framed these two characters alongside herself. And particularly when it comes down to a lot of the physical detailings, you know, I remember you talking about Zola's always carrying a really large bag and Stephanie's got a tiny purse that holds nothing. And even there's moments where you're wearing almost similar outfits. Like there's the moment where you're both wearing skin tight pants and a tube top, but you're wearing different fabrics and different colors and your nails are done ever so slightly differently even when there are these similarities um, and so I was just very curious about a lot of the conversations that you and Janixa had about how you wanted to frame some of the similarities in trajectories with these characters but really to always highlight the difference in how they're experiencing these moments. Yeah I mean that's all that's all Janixa's brain she doesn't there's not one thing in the movie or that wasn't written that she has not given given the utmost respect and thought I think she, like, you know, my nails were black with hearts. Riley's were pointy. Um, there's like an, a part where she's wearing a snake outfit and I'm wearing, you know, like she just, Janixa just, I don't know, she's just, she's just a genius. She, we had the Garden of Earthly Delights, this three panel painting that she showed us that like kind of encapsulates hell, heaven, and like purgatory and kind of like, was like, she showed us Dina Lawson photos and like, I mean, Janix is just, she didn't miss a beat. She doesn't miss a beat. She knows what she wants, what she's doing. Yeah. And as part of your preparation for the role, you spent three weeks working at a strip club and really having a lot of conversations with the women that worked there as well. Um, and I really appreciate and love the fact that you brought so much agency to this character and you really showed, you know, the business side, the entrepreneurial entrepreneurship that she has to have, you know, and the fact that she knows her value and she knows her worth and, and was very interested in how much of that came out of the time that you spent doing that research and actually doing some of that work yourself. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that like a lot of my life experiences and just being in different parts of the world and the way I grew up and, you know, growing up in Inglewood, but going to private Catholic school, I've just like, my whole life has kind of prepared me for, to bring, I guess, the color I wanted to bring to Zola, but also I felt like, um, I mean, a large theme about this movie is agency. And I think like, even when I was gearing up to play the role, I made a decision. I'm like, I was turning 28 and I'm like, I gotta stop apologizing for my space. Is that something that, because of the way that you picked up and started doing that differently in working on this project, has that really carried through since you worked on this film? Because I mean, you shot this film, what, two, three years ago now? Right. In the pandemic. It absolutely does. I feel like that with every role, like I always ask myself, am I willing? A, sometimes I find that the thing that I'm working on is something that I've healed in my personal life. Or it's like, have you healed it? Or like, I act like before I, decide I want to do something once it once it's in that part like once it's like now I get to make that decision I'm just like how is this going to expand me and why are we telling the story and blah 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 you know it's like I try to be really intentional about if I have the capacity and if I'm available if I can move Taylor out of the way to lend myself in service of the truth of the character I also wanted to talk about some of Janix's directing style and how that informed your collaboration together in bringing this all to screen because 
you know, the entire story is told through your character's perspective. And there's so many moments where we see whatever she sees and we learn things as she learns right. them along the way throughout this journey as well. And how did that impact a lot of the blocking and figuring out, you know, even just the physicality of where am I going to be in the scene versus where is the camera going to be and working with her on those beats? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, there are times where you, you, you don't see Zola, but you feel her because you know, you're watching it through her eyes and she's narrating obviously. And it is really specific in that, you know, the movie already exists hyper, it's hyperbolous. It's a, it's the interpretation of someone's tweets. And then someone took the tweets and expanded on it. Right. And like, you know, some people are like, it's not long enough. And you're like, but, but the tweets, she, uh, the first sentence is, y'all want to hear a story about how me and this fell out, right? So she lets you know how they fell out. And then the movie ends, because that's how they fell out. So um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, Janix, I, I think it's like, the whole time Zola is this engaged observer and you know that from the minute you hear her voice and that you're seeing it through her eyes. But obviously we all know that like all narrators are lous or narrators or people who are telling their, everyone has a perception of what happened and interpretation. And, you know, in this sense, this is Zola's story. Zola told it, she created the imagery. And, and so of course, that's why there's that nod at, when it flips and, and at Stephanie's version, you know, it's like she's nodding at like they both have different interpretations of what went ha or what happened, but this is Zola's telling of it. So, um, but I think in all of the blocking, it was just like it was con it was a lot of there were moments of just like deep sighs or just like eyes or you know moments of like I think where she focused just on like me taking everything in and. Um, and letting also the audience fill in how they feel about the situation, you know, where you like can empathize, sympathize, and also you're just like, what in the fuck, you know? And you mentioned the idea of her being an observer to a lot of things as well. And, and with that way in which we get to see her just taking things in. And there's so many scenes where when you step back and look at them, you're very much at the edge of the frame. You know, three or four characters are over on this side. Right. There's a moment where you're physically outside standing on a balcony. Was that something that was very conscious to all of you throughout to really think about her always being at the edge and always just watching everything that's going on around her? Um, I think, I mean, yeah, Janixa was pretty, it was pretty clear, like energetically, I was the one that was observing and taken on this wild ride. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, in person, the blocking is like, it's them and me. But um, yeah, I haven't really, I mean, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm also really interested in the humor of this film because it is a comedic film, but it's never at the behest of its central character. It's never making fun of her in any situation. And if right. anything, it's almost speaking about the way in which we process trauma through humor to a great right. degree. Um, and so I was just very curious about finding the comedic voice and that particular you know, specificity of tone. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, I think, I think collectively humans, um, process their trauma through humor in the black community. It's a big one for us because there's trauma everywhere all the time. And you, you know, I think that meme culture and social media, like you'll notice, you know, whether it's like a, whatever meme account floats your fancy. It's like, wow, this is, you know, when people talk about their like childhood experiences or like when your parents would have to say that you have to turn off the light in the car because the cops are going to come or there's different things that I think like, Black people all share this strange collective experience that like you can't even sometimes make sense of, but it happened. And like, you know, your your mom that's like, you always on that phone. Like there's always some kind of like thing that binds us. It's really funny that we all laugh about like, just like a black mom with her purse, like not wanting to put it down because things look dirty. Like, it's just an interesting thing. But overall, I think that, yeah, this is a dark, it's a dark comedy, but I think it's, it's, um, I mean, life as it's happening, it's like, it's so crazy. I think all the time, like everything, like it's just, 
I don't know, most things that are pretty traumatic and crazy in time end up being quite funny and because they're outrageous. And it's just like, what kind of video game is this? You know, whether it's like, I think someone driving and running from driving really fast from the cops or when you think about the outrageousness of it all, it's actually quite hilarious. Like we all are just, it's, it's insanity. You know, it's always some shit. Um, but like in this situation, like, you know, that it's so outrageous. It's so, the stakes are insane and yet no one's really reacting like it is, you know, it's just like, but it's outrageous. It's sad. And it's also just like, it's like all, it's almost like all you can do is laugh sometimes I think. That idea of, of the stakes being really outrageous and the tension that builds in the film is really fascinating as well, because in essence, the entire film takes place over about 48 hours. So there's not very much time in which we're living with these characters and building to such a high level of what the stakes are for them. Um, and again, it works because it's grounded through character. It's not trying to be ridiculous. It's really telling us that, you know, the humanity of the story. Yeah. Um, did you did you talk with Janixa a lot or the you know Riley and the rest of the cast about that idea of building the tension or did it just come very naturally through what was written in the story that we're watching play out? No, we didn't talk about building the tension. I think we all just were as honest as we could and as present as we could be each day of shooting. I mean, we we didn't have many days of shooting. I think we shot in like 24 days or something crazy like that. And or 17. It was something really, really low. But like we all wanted to be there. Janixa created an environment and she that was like safe and made us feel like we could do this and it's Tampa so that has its own atmosphere and no I think actually like in real life Riley and I were building and growing and like a real friendship like we got so close so fast so if anything like there was in real life the non-tension and the joy of it was like giving a, giving it tension because we felt comfortable to like try shit and laugh and be able to like, we laughed so much, you know, when Coleman had to do crazy scenes and be outrageous and inappropriate. Like it's, he's the sweetest man in the world, you know, just like, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, I don't think, I think rather than discussing tension, we just like, we were all committed and knew and Janixa was so specific and detailed about each of, and had spoken to each of us individually about what she needed, like a puzzle, like a, I don't know, a puzzle. Like it was like, we just kind of, I, you know who you are, you know who you are you, and let's go. So, yeah. I also love the way that you and Riley, you capture that essence that's so specific to female friendship where you meet someone and you just have that yeah. energy that clicks and immediately you're like, we're best friends, we've known each other forever. Yeah. And then, they start to, you know, then she starts to draw back from her, but you play it and really use a lot of the physicality, like the moment where they first get out to the club and, you know, Riley's there taking pictures on her cell phone. She's physically sitting in your lap, your kind of arms around each other. And so you use a lot of physicality to really explore that as well. Um, and so it was, it was just interested in a lot of the choices that you made in that respect and expressing the friendship that really just combusts at the beginning and then gradually starts to trickle away. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it was, Janixa was really clear. She always said, she used the example from Baz Luhrmann's movie, um, the fish tank scene, the Romeo and Juliet. And like, just how that feels when you first connect and you feel like someone sees you or you speak the same language or you both are like, just as petty or just as quick or just as like self-deprecating. And you're like, oh my God, me too, you know? And then you go on a road trip to hell and shit starts getting sideways. And it's like, wow, this is, if anything, it's it's a tragedy because she feels super betrayed and like, you know, then she realizes like Stephanie's done this before and where you're just like recounting everything. Like um, there was actually like originally written like, cause there's a part where she goes, damn bitch, your, your boobs look like two apples. I wish my, something about her titties or something. And like there was an old version where she commented on different women that she'd taken on these road trips and use different types of fruit to talk about. Like there used to be like a version of that that existed, but 
And then I also really love the fact that we have all those scenes throughout the film that break the fourth wall, you know, and it opens on the two of them, not in any real world setting, but in this room with this neon right. lighting and these mirrors and you're both applying lipstick and, and brushing your hair and similar, but again, just slightly different ways. Um, how did you really want to use a lot of those scenes to play around with the internalization of a character in a completely different way outwardly? I think because there's like multiple voices in one's head when they're reacting, when they're thinking, when they're reflecting, when they're talking to their mom, whatever, like, um, but like the voice when she's like, y'all see this shit, but also like to herself is like, this is some shit. Like, you know, it's, it's, I think, um, I mean, yeah, I didn't write it, but that's how it was written. Like it was narrating the whole time and, and narration is an internal voice and, and so I think it just gives you an insight to how she's processing the outrageousness of it all. Like, this isn't what I signed up for. You guys saw this, right? Like, you know, there's a, a reaching out to the audience. Like, do you see this shit? And then I also wanted to ask about your dancing in the movie because, you know, you have hugely extensive experience as a professional dancer and, you know, in particular trained a lot in ballet, but pole dancing is such a different style and such a different technique and the muscles that it uses are very different and it's incredibly, you know, challenging as an art form. Um, so how did you set about almost having to recalibrate and reconfigure the way that you think about movement with your body for those scenes in the movie? Oh, it was so much, di it's different because being technically trained, it's almost like I had to throw everything out that I trained to become, which is like placement and technicalities and pointed toes and being pulled up. And like, you know, I just really wanted to look like a stripper, whatever that means. But my interpretation of what I, the women I saw that commanded the stage in strip clubs when I worked there for four weeks to prepare for the role was like, it's it's looser and it's like not as you're not as you're not thinking about the place as it's not so placed it's relaxed in a sense it's but it's like agency and it's commanding you know attention and it's just like you're it's not as thought about in the way that like me as a ballerina or when I would take flamenco it's not placed it's like it's um it's fluid and but I think just having the discipline to want to like be good as a dancer and wanting to get it helped. But I did have to like undo and relax into it and not be so placey, I think. And not so like, it doesn't call for the technicalities. It calls for actually relaxing and being kind of like, it's it, I think being stripping is actually quite internal. Like, People are enjoying you enjoying yourself is how, is what I noticed in the women that I was attracted to in the club. Like they're like really like, of course they're putting on a show, but they're like enjoying themselves, you know? And when we see you on stage, the choreography of that scene is really spectacular, even between the fluidity of your motion on stage and the way that the camera really just follows you in that instance. And so what was the journey of the choreography in terms of the stage movement and how Janixa wanted to capture you coming together? Yeah, I mean, I worked with I worked with um, I worked with the, this amazing man, Miles, here in L.A., while I also worked at Crazy Girls. And then we kind of came up with steps together that would look good, that would be filmed well. Like Janixa wanted me to learn this crazy move called Birds of Paradise. And I was like, yeah, no, I don't think I can. It's so hard. It's like a let, like one leg up on the pole. And like, I don't know, but I learned from Miles. I learned from Girls at the Club. And then I also was really like, really, really firm on not um, wanting to look like someone who wanted to take pole dancing lessons because that's just what they felt like doing and putting a pole in their living room. Like I wanted to look like a person who like has been working at a restaurant and it's like, I'm gonna strip. You know what I mean? Like it's not as thought out. It's not as luxurious. And yeah, we just, we, I worked with the, yes, yeah, so I worked with Miles and I worked with, um, this woman, Kashina, the warrior in my, I mean, in Tampa, Florida. And she helped us just kind of make it more fluid with the, with the tricks that I learned. Um, and yeah, it's hard. I had bruises all over my legs and 
it's really hard. It's incredible what what those women are able to do and men, but yeah. And even outside of those scenes with the role as a whole, you've talked about how, you know, as a dancer, you're always very aware of your body and you had to think about your body in a very different way. And so what were the ways in which you found yourself thinking about your body in a completely different way for this performance? I just think I had to let a lot of those things go, you know, the way things jiggle or like whatever, just like dumb self-conscious things that we all do to ourselves. Um, and it was really liberating. And just, again, just being less placed and like, you know, needing, it's just, um, it's a more, it's, I think that it was like, it was more about the energy and just feeling good about oneself and not apologizing for their space, taking up space actually, you know? And I think that was probably, perhaps why like on a subconscious level I manifested or um, not even manifested, but called in something that was asking me to rise to that occasion. And outside of just making this movie, you know, you've talked before about how in your early 20s auditioning was such a different process because it was almost waiting for other people to tell you who you were and what your identity in the industry was going to be. And it sounds like that's something that's really evolved for you over the years. And now it's more about a process of telling other people who you are. Um, and so I just wanted to ask about that journey and really navigating your space in the industry and really completely you turning your perspective and you know, bringing your identity forth first and foremost. Yeah, I mean, I think I approach it in the way that I, like, it's all, to me, it's all a prayer. It's all spirituality. So, you know, if you're waiting on everyone to inform you who you are, you'll be waiting forever because everyone's waiting to inform. Everyone's, first of all, we're all so fickle and like the way that we perceive the world or go through the world or how we feel about ourselves informs how we treat other people. But aside from that, like, I just like, think that I got tired of needing so much validation and like really just getting quiet and validating myself. Like, do I like this? Is this any good for me? Do I have the space for this? Like, what is this going to teach me? Can I expand on it? Like, you know, and if it's, if it's, um, if it's like widening my capacity for compassion or empathy or understanding the human condition, then it's a hell yes for me. But if I find that it's just like, oh, this isn't quite this doesn't fight quite feel right in my mouth or I'm not really sure why, what the story, like why we're telling the story or I just think like that has strengthened my intuition and strengthening my intuition has given me the more, given me more freedom to know that A, rejection's protection and B, you know, what's meant for me won't miss me. And like, yeah, I have, you know, you, you could, I've worked really hard for things recently that I just like didn't get. And I still just like thank it, thank it for what I learned and like know that that's like making someone else's day when they get it. And there's enough for, there's enough to go around. I mean, I, there's an abundance of opportunities and stories to be told. So I know that the right ones will come. And I just like got tired of needing so many outer things because that's also conditional. And like the only, um, I think the only like path to like freedom and being able to like truly ascend is like unconditionality which is like super hard to master in a conditional world but also like affirming oneself and like noticing how your energy feels when you feel really good and when you're doing something and it feels a bit draining or it doesn't quite resonate with you or it's hard to memorize I've had that before I'm like maybe this is hard to memorize because I'm just not supposed to be saying it you know well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I'm so excited that people are finally going to get to see your fantastic work in Zola. Thank you so much, Taylor. Thank you so much.